was called Mr. And at a certain age, you start addressing him as Mr. Okay, but Master, in other place, in other parts of the world, Master was a was a higher title than than Mister. Okay. Um, so, in the first century, the word because in, in John it says Rabbi means Master, but in the Synoptics it says Rabbi means Teacher, right? And and. Jewish people like the, the, the teacher thing better, so we pretended that it means teacher rather than taking the John thing, which says master, which is what it really means. So we haven't told anybody about the John passage. We just tell them about the synoptics passage. Um, but I like to tell my congregation that it means master because I want them to, to get used to that. Um, um, the fact is, is that um, I think that there were many different ways of saying master in the first gener in the first century. Rav and Ravi were two of them. Mar and Mari were two two more. Rav and Ravi would be Hebrew. Mar and Mari would be Aramaic, uh, and they mean the same thing. And Mar, by the way, is like Mister M R Mar, okay, uh, which means master, literally. Um, and so, and that's how you get Mr. Uh, and Mr. is just master, with just mispronounced. It is. Mr. is master, just mispronounced. Um, and, and then Lord is really just another form of master in English. And there are different forms of the word Lord, too, in the first century. There's Adon. Lord, L, small L, small, small L, small O, small R, small D. There's Adoni, my Lord, small L, small R, small O, small R, small D. There's Adonai, which is Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, I think. And I have been trying in my studies to find out when that switch happens, when Adonai is used in, in prayer to take the place of the name of God in Jewish prayer. Because it's used in place of the name of God. Now, all this is all very complicated because in the Gospels, actually throughout the entire New Testament, <coughs> Jesus is never called God but only Lord. So that becomes, which title are we using for him? My reading of the New Testament sees Jesus as Messiah, but not as God. And that would fit in with some of the Eastern churches, but not with, not with your church. Let's try, try some of the non-professionals. <laughs> Give me a break. Um, when in the Bible, Watch this be um, hard. Jesus says that I and the Father are the same, in the translation, does that mean that they were both God? Um, it's, it's, it's talking about, um, I don't have my Bible with yeah, me. we need the Bible because it's, <laughs> it's God, um, my, uh, scripture says I and my father are one. Yeah. I, I am, I, uh, but it's also, it's, uh, my father sent, uh, it's, it's about who, what is sent, right? It's, it's, well, see, I don't know if you really understand about us. We're one this people. Right. Right. We believe that uh, Jehovah is in creation, Son of right. Redemption, right. and the Holy Ghost in latter days. Right. Now, what I'm talking about is the passage that I'm familiar with is the one um, where Jesus says uh, something about something that is being sent from the Father is being sent through me. No, there's no Holy Ghost. It's, no, no, it's, it's in the it's in the Gospels, and it's and I would say it's probably, if I remember correctly, it's probably only in in Matthew, and and I have to look it up. But um, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I need the passage. If you could find the passage, then I could I could comment on it. Um, yeah, I need to see the passage. If you can find it, that would help me. 
I'm not a. If it's John, then that's a whole nother, a whole, whole nother, another ball of wax. Oh, chapter yeah. 14, that's a permissible chapter. Yeah. Okay. John is John is different because John is talking on a on a more s spiritual level. I mean, John is talking on a um, on a level of what I have to call um, on a mystical union level, and then I understand the idea of unification and things like that. And I, I really just can't talk about it in terms of history. It talks more in, in terms of uh, mysticism. So uh, I can't, I just, I, I can't give you interpretations from that. I don't study the, the mystical traditions. <laughs> yes, sir. The kingdom of heaven is present in, in our actions. It's an obligation to do God's will. So it's not, a, it's not an actual kingdom. It's an obligation to, to make God's will manifest. That's what the, the term means in our tradition. And I think that's what Matthew has in mind when he uses the term. That's what my that's what the two hundred and fifty pages of my dissertation are all about. Kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God. And I just went took every time it was used and tried to see whether the the Jewish definition as it was used in the first and second century, whether that definition would make sense if I translated it back into the New Testament passages. And it in all in all the passages it makes sense. And some of them it doesn't make a lot of sense but it makes it makes sense. In mo in eighty percent of the passages, it's the only thing that makes sense. In a couple of them, you got to squeeze it in. And the scribes and the Pharisees were taught. I don't know which is which, but one is goes by the literal word, and uh, the other one goes by the literal word and by mouth to mouth. Right. Uh, stories. Right. I don't know which is which. Was that ever put down, uh, written down, or is it still carried from, you know, like I understand it's in tribes in Africa, they pick a person, they teach them the story of the tribe before, no. is that still carried on, or is it written no. down anywhere? No. Um, the, I, I think you're talking about the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The, the Sadducees were supposedly the literalists, and the Pharisees taught the oral law. And uh, the oral law is what we call our Talmud. And the Talmud was written down in two stages. The first stage was written down in the year 200 of the Common Era. And then the rest of it was finished, some say in the year 600, some say the rest of it was finished in the year 1000, but whatever, it's, it's been written down. It's in 20 volumes. Um, and we study it all the time. Uh, and uh, it's all the different sages over hundreds and hundreds of years debating every issue back and forth, back and forth. You've often heard the joke that two rabbis, three opinions. And uh, that's, what, that's from the Talmud, because every, every law in, that comes up in the Talmud has the rabbis debating it back and forth, back and forth, to get every single nuance that's possible in the law. For example, the, the, the Bible says to leave a corner of the field for the poor, which is a beautiful idea. Okay, first of all, you have to ask yourself the question, what if I'm not a farmer and I don't have a field? You know, do I have to leave a corner if I don't have a field? How do I leave a corner? So the rabbis have to then define, what do I leave if, I have, if I'm a businessman and I don't have a field to leave a corner? Then they have to define, what's a corner of a field? What if I am a farmer and I want to leave, do I have to leave one corner? Do I have to leave four corners? Do I have to, what constitutes a corner? How much is a corner? Is it? A quarter of the field, or is it a sixtieth of the field? They finally decide it's a sixtieth of the field. Now, does it have to be a sixtieth total? Can it be one sixtieth from one corner, or does it have to be a total sixtieth from all four corners? And they debate all these things. What if your field's divided in half by a stream? Then do you have to take eight corners altogether? <laughs> so they, they divide, they discuss all these things. That's why we have 20 volumes of this stuff. So it did get all written down. That's the oral law. So that's the second half of your question. 
The first half of your question is a little bit more complicated because the definitions of the Pharisees and the Sadducees that we've had all these years are wrong. You're, it's not your fault. The Jewish and Christian scholars have had it wrong for 2,000 years. And as I said, the Pharisees were not the people of the oral law. They were the ultra-pietists of their age. They were not the sages who became the rabbis. That's a whole different group of people. And the Sadducees were, were indeed the literal interpretationalists who wanted to go back to the biblical rules and the biblical priesthood. But there was no biblical priesthood around in the first century. They had been pushed out first by, uh, by Alexander the, Greek, the Great and his followers around 300 before the Common Era, especially the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. I don't know if you want me to go through this long history. But then the Maccabees, who were the heroes of the Hanukkah story, I'm sure you've heard of the story of Hanukkah. Well, they took over because they were high priests, but they were not from the original family of uh, Tzadok, who David and Solomon had used as the high priest. And the Sadducees are, in Hebrew, at Tzadu, Tzadukim. They were followers of the high priest of Tzadok, who had been in place from the time of King David. And there hadn't been a high priest from the line of Tzadok since the time of the Seleucids in the year 300, before the Common Era. So the Sadducees, who had hoped to put back uh, one of the old-time priests, these were the guys, give me the old-time religion. You know? <laughs> and, you know, um, there's nothing wrong with the old-time religion except it was 300 years old and it wasn't coming back. So there might have been some of those guys around, but they weren't major players. And I promise you that Caiaphas wasn't one of those folk. That I promise you. So no matter what you read in the paper, and they will say that Caiaphas was a Sadducee, he wasn't. I promise you that. This is a secret. I want, to, I want to keep it, don't tell more than a hundred of your closest friends. Because nobody knows this except for the people in this room, okay? Because no matter how many scholars I tell this to, they don't want to pay attention to history. Too much trouble. It goes against 2,000 years of missed scholarship. Yes, sir. Okay, the, the, um, the festival of the first fruit is known to us as Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. It's known in the New Testament as the Pentecost, and it's the time uh, when the disciples reassembled in Jerusalem 50 days after the Passover, after the, uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus. It's not a three-day festival, it's a one-day festival, um, and... That, uh, that's when the famous speaking in tongues occurred in Jerusalem. The Passover story and the resurrection uh, is a one-day holiday, again, in which the Paschal Lamb was brought to Jerusalem, and it was offered in Jerusalem, and then the families would take the Paschal Lamb, and they would eat it as they told the story of the Exodus from Egypt. They talked about how they were saved from Egyptian slavery, and they were brought to freedom, and then finally they went to the Red Sea, and they were, um, they were freed from Egyptian slavery once and for all when the Red Sea parted. And then 50 days after the, the escape from Egypt, they came to Mount Sinai when God gave the Ten Commandments. So there's a con uh, con uh, congruence of holidays. The first fruit and the giving of the Ten Commandments are both celebrated on the Feast of Weeks, which is the festival of the first fruits. So there's, those two things go together. But it's not a three-day holiday, and it's not connected to the, to the death and resurrection. It's 50 days later, and it's the, the Feast of the Pentecost, which is described in Acts. Yes? Yeah, you mentioned that the scholars made a, a lot of errors. Um, <laughs> Don't they always? <laughs> yeah, thank you. In the tabernacle, the books 
Wow, uh, the tabernacle and the and the temple. Um, the description of the tabernacle is pretty explicit, and I think that we can pretty well guess what it looked like. Um, when it comes to the offerings, what you're calling sacrifices, I want to call them offerings, because I think what Jesus did was a sacrifice. Yes. I think what the Israelites were doing were making offerings to God. Amen. Okay, there's a difference. Jesus gave up something so that you could have something better. What the Israelites were doing were bringing something as kind of a gift to God. Sometimes it was a gift because they had gotten away from God and they had to get back close to God. They had to become at one with God, put at one together, get atone. They had to atone for a sin or they had to atone for a transgression. So sometimes they brought this gift to God to get back close to God. Sometimes they brought a gift to God because they felt so full of thanks 